you've been doing this, the state of the Mozilla, for three consecutive times now, plus your uh, talk a year before that on culture. So it's been four times you've been up here. Um, we've been, tur yeah, I had to backthink it. Um, but uh, we, GTL does a great service by cr uh, creating these videos at the end of your presentations. How much circulation do they get inside Mozilla as a tool to share that pride and success and that story with fellow Mozillans? I'm, I'm afraid to ask, you know? <laughs> Um, I am worried about vanity metrics in general. Uh, on a personal note, I do know that I do know that members of our leadership team have watched me make this presentation, uh, and it's flattering that they do. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that um, one of the reasons that we get a chance to be uh, to just make sure we're all on message. Uh, one of the things that this is valuable for, uh, in a sense is that because my job at Mozilla involves so much communication internally as well as externally, uh, if I'm not on message with everyone else, then you know, we have a problem. Uh, but it does, uh, it is, it is a thing that I know people are watching. I don't know how much they're watching it. Uh, and my hope is that, you know, I put it on blog and I put it on Planet Mozilla, and my hope is that a lot of people see it. Uh, but. I don't really know, and I don't know if I really want to know. You know? Uh, thank you. Um, so I teach the Comparative Programming Languages course here at Ryerson, and um, we're, we've been using Rust as one of the four languages we do for the last several years. So thank I'm you. curious where Rust is going. So my, my personal um, programming world is I will only program in two languages, small talk for everything I possibly can, and Rust, if I need that low-level um, mm -hmm. stuff, I will not program in C or C++ anymore. Um, so I'm curious about where Rust is going and how soon before Firefox is completely rusted. So where Rust is going as a language is 100% outside of my scope of expertise. I know that it is growing extremely rapidly, and I we. The hope for us is that we eventually get to a point where we can effectively supplant C. Um, we've written enough binding code in Firefox proper that people who want to incrementally replace parts of their products outside of Firefox with you know, Rust a chunk at a time should at this point have a reasonable path for doing that. We've beaten that path ourselves. Um, more holistically, uh, the servo project and the Rust pro and Rust within Firefox continues to be it, it continues to be very fertile ground for us, both in terms of uh, developing the work, developing the actual browser itself, uh, and in terms of parting things out a bit at a time as they mature, as they become ready. Uh, so this is a very um, non-specific answer for which I apologize, but the uh, the short version is that eventually we expect in the fullness of time, but we don't have a roadmap for it right now to be able to eventually have the browser written predominantly in Rust and JavaScript. Right now, the browser is written in a sort of weird hybrid of uh, C++ and Rust and the JavaScript as the display layer. Uh, we're doing a little bit of work there around trying to make JavaScript itself better as well uh, in a few ways. But um, our own in-house version of JavaScript is something we're trying to fix. Uh, and it's been a while since I've looked at this, so I'm sure that one of my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we use JavaScript in a way that essentially lets us run it behind the C preprocessor. So there's a lot of stuff in there that is very, very weird and alien to you know, normal human web developers, uh, JavaScript. And in the fullness of time, what we would ultimately want to work towards is Rust and JS, like normal human JS, in so much as that term means anything. Uh, but we don't really have an immediate time horizon for that. It's going to be just migration when stuff is ready, migration when stuff is ready. The other question I had was you alluded to Pocket or mentioned Pocket very briefly. I'm curious um, how Mozilla sees Brave and their model. <laughs> uh, 
I don't want to speak for the company on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, and I feel bad as a representative of a major browser uh, talking any kind of smack about somebody with smaller market share uh, than we have. Uh, having said that, speaking only for myself, um, it's not obvious to me that a browser that both relies on man in the middling your advertising viewing and then monetizing that via a cryptocurrency is a viable long-term approach to sustainability. I had to bite my tongue really hard to get that out without saying anything else, but um, that's, uh, I'm sorry. I have strong feelings about the topic. I don't feel like punching down. Hi. Great talk. Very inspirational. Thank you. It's kind of you to say so. I sort of have my horizons limited a little bit to the engineering side. Just lack of imagination, maybe. Lack of uh, leverage as an individual to do anything else. Um, but I would say the things that Mozilla has done for me that you haven't mentioned. Mozilla is a very good Toronto community member, hosting meetings sometimes and meetup groups and Rust group, for example. Um, the people I've met from Mozilla have been great people. Seems like there's a great corporate culture I'm inferring from the few people I know. And that matters, and it's that you have an, uh, an employee footprint here that I think is pretty important. Um, anyway, the, my problem, part of it is, is I'm old. And it seems like the growth part of the internet is really young people. At least that's, you know, Facebook is shrinking a little bit because young people don't like it. Doesn't matter that I don't like it. And how do you, as a bunch of adults, figure out what's coming next? <laughs> well, so many of them are on our lawn that we figure out that we have to have. <laughs> I'm sorry, I started that. There are so many kids on our lawn, we have to be able to do something with all these kids. Um, that's a hard question to ask. One of, the, um, one of the things that we are seeing broad trends towards, not just like, heavily invested both from young people in general and, uh, and so, like society at large, but specifically young people are becoming much more conscientious about their own degree of agency over their privacy, their data, their security. They understand that having informed choices about what they choose to share and when and with who right, matters because these are people who have grown up very viscerally aware of the consequences of those failures, right, of the costs of inadvertently giving away too much data. I cannot, like I, I'm also an old, and I cannot imagine going through, say, high school with a cell phone. Like, to me, going through an, a social environment like high school with a smartphone, much less going through it with social media, must feel like going through high school with a bomb strapped to your chest. Like, literally any terrible thing could happen at any moment, right? And I cannot believe the stress that modern young people, modern high school students, for example, are under in that context. Um, but it's like, what is water? That is the environment that they, social environment that they've grown up in. An important part for us is as people who want to have significant opinions about not only what agency and safety is, but what choices, what are meaningful choices to people in participating on this, is to try to stick to our values of being an open participatory organization where people can weigh in about what it is that matters to them, and how they can build that into the tools that they use. Um, like every now and then, I will turn the ad blocker on my browser off and just go live like people with default settings for a week, and it's amazing. I mean, it's a nightmare on stilts, but we have to do that now and then just to make sure that we're 
helping people make good decisions, that we're seeing how people live and helping them make good decisions. Um, we're also trying to do the same, uh, in a, and in a sense, you can treat young people in an area as a specific culture, right? As in the same way that you would treat people from a different country, a different region, as having a specific culture. Right? We try to be as inclusive as possible. We try to build an environment where people can have a say as much as possible and to make it worth people's while to be a part of it. Um, you talked about the Toronto office culture uh, and one of the things that we are quite proud of in that office is not just that we have built a very sort of open, uh, we've built a place that is not only worth caring about as an organization, but we've worked hard to make sure that that is an environment where the fact of caring can make a difference. Like it's just little small things, but we don't have a Keurig machine in the office because no amount of giving a damn will let a Keurig produce better coffee. Like you're getting brown water from that machine. It doesn't matter how much you're invested in it. So we have tools there that are sometimes harder to use, but where the fact of caring matters. Um, we've tried to build, make our organization an organization where the fact of caring matters. And we've tried to make, well, our hope is that as we get more invested in mobile, as we make our tools more accessible on mobile, that we will make our values more accessible and more participatory in the process. So it's not a perfect answer and it's kind of long-winded and rambly. Um, but the belief is that people actually value this stuff. Our fundamental core belief is that people do care about their privacy. People do care about their agency. And we think that we're seeing signs of that now in the world, in the market of people making active choices, young people making active choices about how they choose to participate and why and what's in it for them, right? So a little bit long-winded and rambly, but that's it. I can never pass up a chance to make a kids around my lawn joke. It's one of the privileges of being over 40. It's fantastic. I love it. Please. Yeah, um, I just, uh, whenever I do web development, I'm finding that uh, one of the biggest barriers I find is Apple and the fact that you always have to code to whatever standards Apple has chosen to implement in mobile Safari mm -hmm. for the iPhone. And basically, like, if they choose they don't, that they don't want to support a certain technology, that's it. There's no other choice. Everything you do on the web has to uh, be coded to whatever, like, they're the lowest common denominator now. They're the Internet Explorer of, mm -hmm. of the modern web. Yes. And I'm just wondering, does Mozilla have some sort of strategy or some sort of story of, of how, they're, how to deal with this? The difficulties of the mobile web on iOS are, like, on the one hand, on the one hand, Apple has done well with the fact that they allow very little remote execution code on iOS in any format other than the browser. Like outside of their implementation of WebKit on iOS, they don't allow remote code to run. And that's, like I understand the trade-offs that they have there and the concerns that they have. The iOS ecosystem is much more predictably stable. Uh, and much more predictably secure than the Android ecosystem in that context. Um, and unfortunately for us, what that means is that most of our iOS efforts, uh, like, well, I mean, the other market reality of, the other market reality of that is that if you are selling things accessible via a phone, that you target Apple users. Um, because Android users are just don't monetize, don't, don't quote unquote monetize in anywhere near the same degree, which is, terrible, but it's also a fact. Um, and so for us, as much as we would like to be able to drive that conversation, we don't have a ton of leverage over iOS. Uh, for us, when we are building the mobile web browsers, we are, at least on iOS, sort of required to use their implementation of WebKit and wrap things around it. Um, I don't know what our longer term plans are there, and I don't know how much leverage we have in that context. Um, but we've worked really hard at making sure that our dev tools, at least on the product side of things, can help people in your situation meet their needs um, and target that platform in a way that is meaningful. Um, I'm sorry that that's not a better answer for you, uh, but they've got, like Apple has successfully executed on the walled garden ecosystem. Um, and they have, uh, you know, they have shown that it can be if, they are, if you are disciplined and effective about it. And it's kind of abhorrent to at least me personally that the model of if you're like if you're not going to enjoy doing it, you won't be allowed to do it at all, is not who I want to be and how I want to live. But Apple's gotten a lot of mileage out of it, 
and we don't have a lot of leverage with them, unfortunately. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned DevTools stuff. Do, like, do you, what do you mean by like, do you, do you have things like Android components for iOS? Or that... We don't have an Android component for iOS right now. Um, what we have is developer tools on the desktop that let you model things on the mobile side of things as well. Um, but that is, not, uh, that is not really a full or satisfying answer to your question, unfortunately. Um, one thing you said about uh, uh, advertising being evil. I remember a couple of years ago there was a lot of talk about micropayments for paying authors and publishers and mm -hmm. all sort of things. And then that talk kind of disappeared. Is there anything that Mozilla plans to implement along those lines or that idea is dead? Uh, I think that the difficulty with micropayments was that you would have to get payment processors involved in micropayments and that meant that every micropayment idea effectively had a financial lower bound on the cost of, on the, the amount of micro that could be. Right? And that lower bound meant, I mean, the dream was you'd have like fractions of a cent and you'd be able to give some people you love a fraction of a cent, but just by looking over to them. And unfortunately, there's two ways for Mozilla to do that. One of them is to be incredibly invasive about understanding in enormous detail every single place you go ever. And the other one is for us to lose buckets and buckets of money. Um, and it turns out neither of those things are really compelling to us as a company. Uh, because like if it if it costs you a minimum of 15 cents to process an individual payment transaction through any standard payment processor and i admit i don't know what the number actually is but it's not like a tenth of a penny it's like a quarter or something within an order of magnitude of that and so there are unfortunately the reason micro payments never really panned out is because the micro never got small enough um this is probably not, not a good suggestion, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, is it possible to use something like a Starbucks model when you just put like $40 on the card and then you use it internally? Again, so you don't have to incur that uh, 15 cent or well, whatever transaction. So again, um, in order for us to do that, we'd have to know where you go. Oh. Like, we, 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 we would have to know, like we who have put so much weight on the idea of you having secure privacy of us not, like we built a huge amount of effort, we put a huge amount of effort into privacy respecting telemetry services, right? So that we can understand things about our users without actually revealing any information about them. Um, it turns out it's much more interesting for us to figure out how to sell those services than it is for us to throw all of that work away and follow you around in your pocket every single place you go forever. Um, because if we have to engage in the distribution of micropayments in some way like that, uh, we have to know so much, so we have to know an awful lot about where you've gone and what you've done and know. Just, just know. I don't want to know, like, I don't want to know where you go on the internet. I just, I just don't. Like, don't take it personally. I feel the same way about everybody else in this room, too. Right? Um, it's, uh, it's not a viable uh, approach for us to take. What is a viable approach for us to take as a business is to take the tools that we have built to be very deliberate about respecting people's privacy, not just in Android components. Uh, one of the things that we are working towards right now is uh, telemetry as a service. Like we've got a whole bunch of mobile clients. We've got a whole bunch of privacy respecting telemetry services. Maybe there's other companies out there that want to be able to have a deep understanding of their user base, but also don't want to live in fear of a GDPR request. Right? Maybe that's worth a couple of bucks a month to them. We're going to find out. I think I may have spilled the bean there, but sure. Anything else? I've actually got a piece of mildly good news for you. I Thank mean, God. I'm, I'm on the periphery of the... Uh, uh, of the advertising business. My name is Dr. Evil. Uh, and when the GDPR came on in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, as we predicted, roughly 19% of people said, do not track. Not unexpected. Mm -hmm. And our, a chunk of our business went down by 19%. Mm -hmm. By the end of the month, it was creeping back up again. Because the advertisers have to set, are being paid by the manufacturers to get ads out there. 
and they're paying the websites perhaps a bit less for not untargeted ads, but they have got a budget that they have to spend. And by the end of the month, roughly three weeks from, from uh, when it came on, the business was back to, to dollar normal again. There will be qualitative differences, but the, qualita the quantitative difference was about zip in, in Germany mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Hmm. I thought you said that was good news. Yes. The, adver the advertisers do it, will put yes. up with the fact mm -hmm. that they don't get to track you. That's good. That's the good part. Oh, that's good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Advertising is a horribly redundant industry or you know, you know, resilient industry. That wasn't going to be good news, but it's, that it, I'll take it as good news. Yeah, it is still Wanamaker's problem. George, yeah. uh, I think it was George Wanamaker said, 50% of my ads bring, bring me 50% of my business. Mm -hmm. I have no way of telling which 50%. That has never changed. Yeah, it's it it should be getting better now that uh, well better for certain values of better uh, with a lot of the consolidation in the industry. But there is just an enormous amount of like waste heat generated by that industry, and so. Yep. All right. Um, yes. Uh, DNS over HTTPS. Yeah. It scares the hell out of me. Why is that? Um, I understand the raw deal we're getting with the current system. Okay. Absolutely. It is insanely stupid. Yes. I'm with you. But the amount of, and I'm hoping you can dispel some misconceptions I have here, the amount of breakage that DNS over HTTPS is going to introduce for us sysadmins or power users or the fact that we are now uh, relying on a central single infrastructure for DNS uh, behind a certificate authority we may or may not trust uh, in a position of power concentrating and as a, a past ISP employee, watching my traffic bypass my CDNs meant to reduce my costs to maintain the service to the mm -hmm. customers. This is a really strange bargain being thrown out there. Why? Like, well, I, yes, turn it on, but how do we how are we mitigating all this craziness it also introduces? So, one of the things that we have not done spectacularly well is made it clear that this is again a case of defaults and choice, right? We're, uh, as we're rolling out DNS over HTTPS now, we are testing it with one provider in the United States. Right? And one of the things that we have not communicated spectacularly well is that in other countries, that will be other providers. But you as a user and you as a deployer of services will have other options as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Pi-hole system now supports DNS over HTTPS. Like You can roll your own at home if that's what you feel like doing. Corporate, corporate networks who are running their own services will be, if they choose to, to be able to deploy their own services as well. Firefox will respect the settings that the user provides, which won't necessarily be the services that the ISP provides, of course, um, because we are, again, beholden to the user, not to the ISP. Uh, but that does not mean that larger organizations, for example, if you have an enterprise deployment uh, of the package, you'll be able to deploy DNS over HTTPS that points to your corporate servers, if that's what, you so, if that's what you're so inclined. Right? In large scales, in large scale deployments, uh, of managed deployments, I will say, you will have options. Uh, in default deployments out of the client, um, it is more important for us to protect the integrity of the user's connections than it is for us to protect the no, the infrastructure behind the ISPs. We trust that the cost model for ISPs will in some sense balance out. DNS is extremely lightweight as it is, right? Um, and I understand that there are load balancing questions on the far side of that as well that are going to make things more complicated. Uh, but again, this is a case where we as an opinionated provider of a browser are putting the user's interests first ahead of everyone else's. Yes, thank you. And that actually reframes it in my mind as the IPv6 adoption problem. That's that's what's got to be solved here, is how do we get 
everyone else to jump on board in a way that works, that mm-hmm. makes this system viable. And it sounds like, yes, there are some significant communication problems on how diversely this system can be deployed. One of the things about working in the open on controversial technology changes, as we frequently do, is that communications missteps on our part become an attack surface for us as an organization. And because our core differentiator as Mozilla is based on trust and user trust, right? that is, you know, we can't just brush that stuff off. Right? Our ability to affect change in the world is fundamentally rooted on whether or not users believe that we are who we claim to be, believe the message that we are saying, and that we have communicated the value prop of choosing our products in a meaningful way. It is, uh, and all that sounds like very sort of predictable corporate speak communication stuff, and I regret it when I talk like that to some extent, but it really is the fact that we declare our difference, we have said that our difference as an organization is user trust, right? Our ability to communicate that effectively, right? Every single person in this room gets a computer with a pretty good web browser on it. It's never ours, right? The most important thing about Firefox and about Mozilla and our products in general is that 100% of the people who are getting those products have chosen them, right? That is not entirely true. Like if you get a whole lens, you're getting our browser on there by default, right? There are a few other marginal cases where you get a Firefox product by default. Virtually 100% of our user base is here because they trust us, right? And one of the downsides of that is that communications for us is there's a direct line between our communication efforts and our market share and our ability to affect change in the world. Uh, and so in this case, we've not done a spectacular job of, we've consistently said we're testing this in the U.S. on a limited set of users. We're testing this in the U.S. on a limited set of users. But we thought that that was enough for people to get that outside the U.S. or for the rest of the users or for everyone else, things could be different. Right? And here we are. And you have a reasonable question about that follow-on is where do I find the resources and tools to understand and manage this change as it rolls out? I, we have a, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Um, and I'm not, we have a, there's a very long-standing joke. Um, if I tell you that it's a key value store in Erlang, does everyone here, anyone here get that reference? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Did you just tell me to go F myself? <laughs> yes, yes. It's a, it's a long-standing cartoon where someone says, where do I get the data? And the person says, uh, it's, you know, it's in a, it's in the place. And the person says, okay, is it, is that a database? And the person says, no, you write a, res- a distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. <laughs> and the person says, did you just tell me to go F myself? <laughs> and I, the answer is, I believe I did, Bob. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. You can beep that part out of the, out of it, but um, no. When you asked when you asked that, and my initial reaction was that a lot of this information was available in public documents on our the Mozilla Wiki. My initial reaction was the first thing that you're going to say is, "Did you just tell me?" <laughs> 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 and, and that's not how I meant that. Uh, we have a lot of documentation on the Wiki about where uh, wiki.mozilla.org about this. Uh, we are improving that documentation week over week as we get close to making larger decisions about this. Uh, As well, like I said, the the Pi hole, the um, the Raspberry Pi firewalling tool also supports this stuff. You can play around with it there. Um, Yeah, it's uh, that information is out there. It's not horribly inaccessible. It's tech documentation, so it's not perfect. Um, And it's in flux, but uh, it's available. It's there. Thank you. So I I've Please. been running my own DNS and not using ISP mm-hmm. for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be the equivalent of what you're doing, and it doesn't cause me problems that I've noticed. So I don't think it's necessarily a big deal. But I could be wrong. Maybe there's some... I mean, my geographic location for my query is known 
by the DNS server that's the authoritative server for the domains I'm querying. So maybe CDSs get it right for me and wouldn't get it right for you. Anyway, that's just a little thing. Yeah. Bigger thing, the culture of the development of the internet has been by a bunch of techies who've got libertarian bents. Um, I don't mean flaming libertarian, some of them are, but uh, we always think of what's good for us as individuals. And I think it's important to think what's good for the community, kind of like the vaccine issue. And mm -hmm. it's really hard to separate the people who are thinking of what's good for the community who are uh, from the people who are thinking they want to accumulate power, like the politicians who want to be able to see everything you do. It's think of the children or whatever the excuse is. T children or terrorists, I don't know which, alternates. So the Children or terrorists. I thought you said children are terrorists. I'm sorry. No, no. I have no. two kids and I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that... You, I don't negotiate with either of them. Yes. We, we, our governments, our police, our employers, and so on, mm -hmm. all need to be able to see into what we're doing because we might be terrorists or we might be, um, yeah, we might be children, or we might be preying on children. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to tell where people are coming from when they advocate for stuff from the community side, but I still think it needs doing. And I think you've alluded to it. How do you, how do you sort out the sheep from the goats? Well, it's, it's quite simple um, to determine who uh, who is more invested in you know, community safety and community efforts and then it is people who are interested in accumulating power uh, or centralizing control. Uh, and the people, and the answer is that who spends the most time listening? Right? People who are actually interested in understanding community problems, people who are interested in serving the interests of the community have as one of their primary goals and primary skills to actually listen and understand what those community challenges, what those problems, what those risks actually are. People who are interested in securing their own interests, in advancing their own interests or the interests of the organization, uh, treat that kind of feedback process as either lip service if they do it at all. Um, and it's very, uh, it's very clear as we have matured as an organization that you can measure how invested an organization is in terms of their you know, are they invested in community health? Are they invested in the broader public good? You can tell how sincerely they are actually, how, how sincere they actually are about that investment by the line that you can draw from the feedback that a member of the community or a member in particular of minorities within those communities has, if you can draw a straight line from that to policy change, right, or to product change, right? It is you will see over and over again that people who are interested in paying lip service to community voices, people who are interested in checking off the community was involved item and then getting on with their lives, uh, will pay little or no cursory, little, very little or no attention to actual community feedback. And actual community feedback will, uh, will virtually never result in anything more than cosmetic and usually no change. Whereas people who are actually seeking to improve the well-being of the community, have community in the room, not just for the unveiling of the product, but for the decision-making that shapes the product, there's the decision-making that shapes the policy. So there's a concept of informed consent, and mm -hmm. community really often needs to be educated. I don't, that sounds like a paternalistic view, but it, just a quick example is when Canada had a consultation about uh, copyright mm -hmm. revision uh, about 20 years ago and they talked about DRM well DRM is a code word that most people wouldn't have known what it meant so it protected digital rights management well that's not really what it is it's control so the notion of informed consent is not a one-way street Right. When we are talking about allowing people to make a fully informed decision about, for example, what risks are in their context, 
right? We can't do that unless that person has also been able to inform our understanding of what risk is in their context, right? Informed consent is not a unilateral decision from one person imposed on another person or a group, right? That is not at all what we aspire to, and that's not, frankly, who we want to be, because it's, as you note, it is bullshit, for lack of a better term, right? The notion of informed consent is a consenting relationship between people to talk about what real risk is to them, right? To talk about what real hazards are and about what real value is on both sides of that discussion. So that when we talk about informed consent, about you giving consent to me to do something with your data, whatever it is, then I understand not only, you know, you understand what I intend to do with that, but I understand where your values lie in this context as well. Um, one fairly extreme example of that is uh, one of my personal favorites is uh, a Japanese colleague of mine who has related that the concept of privacy as we understand it in North America is so culturally different to the Japanese concepts of data protection. But the Japanese word for privacy as we understand it is privashi. It's an anglicized word, right? Because you know, not for good or bad or anything. It's just that my cultural understanding of what that means just doesn't have an analog in that part of the world, right? So in order for me to have a discussion with somebody in that context, in that culture, about the exchange of data, first of all, it's on me to learn what they value, right? What their values are, how they describe them. I can't offer a meaningful, you know, I can't offer that person a meaningful idea of informed consent if I don't have any information about what they actually value or what they're, you know, what they, in their culture, will or will not or can or cannot consent to, right? Uh, we can't, I think this is, this gets into a lot of very profound philosophical arguments that boil down to questions of very real questions of cultural imperialism, right? Very real questions about imposing our values as a Western California-centric organization on a world that thinks very differently about that. Right? And if we are the only voices in the room, if the only people making these decisions about what informed consent looks like live in one corner of one state in one country, uh, then that's not really going to be informed consent once it crosses a border. And it doesn't even have to be a national border once it crosses a state border, right? Or a society. Right, or a class border, exactly, exactly. So the upshot of that is that you make sure that your organization spends a lot of time listening. Uh, and a lot of time really not pretending to be all that smart. Like the secret ingredient here is patience and humility, not knowing what's best for people. Um, because we've tried that and it sucks. We've tried that and it's awful. Um, it is exactly what you say it is. It is offensive, it's patronizing, it's paternalistic. And it's not who we want to be. I found your talk tonight uh, quite motivational and uh, philosophical. Thank you. And um, while you didn't explicitly mention uh, cybersecurity, information security, your talk mm -hmm. did uh, touch on it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't really see a lot of discussions, philosophical discussions uh, coming out of the cybersecurity industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering what are your thoughts on uh, North America's current approach uh, to cybersecurity, information security? Um, is the uh, quote-unquote solution uh, more philosophy-based or uh, human-centric solution than less tech-based? Uh, the reason why I ask is um, I feel uh, while there are tech-based while tech-based solutions such as IDSs, SIMs, uh, pen testing, mm -hmm. uh, will always have a place in uh, protecting us and our systems. I feel that these are mid-level solutions uh, that are being pushed in the culture of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, I believe that just as important, if not more important, are uh, high-level tools. What, what uh, to me are high-level tools such as uh, IT governance, uh, IT service management, auditing, IT culture, uh, and low-level tools such as protocol, certificate, and cookie management, uh, which to me, even if they are also tech-based solutions, are ultimately human-centric solutions. 
so essentially I'm asking is, is cybersecurity information security a lot simpler from a tech point of view than uh, you know it's currently being made out to be today? I was, I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts are. Um, so I think that you were missing two ends of the spectrum there as far as uh, the scope of the problem of IT security in general is. One of them is uh, that above the layer of uh, what was the upper, the most complicated thing you mentioned? There was infosec pen, pen testing, and then there was a layer of that about oh, uh, corporate, corporate governance and protocols. There is a layer above that about like human rights and definitions of what we consider to be the basic level of human rights and human dignity that we have in that space. At the very, un, very other, the lowest end of the technical, like what is data? Like there are questions like what is a piece of data that we you know, how do we identify a piece of data about a person? And how do we identify ownership or care, or a duty of care, for example, for that piece of data once you've obtained it by somebody? We don't presently have a sort of philosophical framework for talking about data ownership and data security as being some element of human rights. Um, and that is clearly going to become necessary. Because, because flat out, I think that it is in our national interests, both as like a nation as us and the national interest in the abstract idea of the national interest, that privacy and data security be really important. Um, in particular, like the, the example that I frankly made up, but it amuses me to tell it, is um, we have privacy as a national security interest because what does war look like if I can draw a straight line from a soldier on a battlefield with facial recognition and Facebook or whatever, if I can draw a straight line between a soldier on the battlefield to where their kids go to school. Like, what, is, what does a national level conflict start to look like when I've got that kind of understanding of specific people doing specific things in specific places? Like maybe I can stop a battalion in its tracks and all I need to do that is one picture of a general, one picture of a school, and a, and a picture of a van, an unmarked white van in front of that school. I don't even need to own the van. I can use Photoshop. Right. That's all it takes. Right. Um, the other side of things uh, is the British have this idea of fit for purpose or duty of care. It's one of the things that they uh, have in their culture. I don't think we really have it in, uh, at least in a matter of Canadian law. Um, we have fiduciary responsibility, but that's in, they have a more general, like a duty of care of X, or what does fit for purpose of a product mean? And that is a philosophical underpinning of stuff. Like it's a non-formalized way of saying, like we don't have a set of absolutely physical ISO standards here yet. We don't have a, like we don't have a set of rules and regulations saying, you know, this helmet needs to be able to take an impact from this hockey puck at this speed and remain intact, you know, at this many newtons, whatever that looks like. Um, before that, there is the layer that, okay, leading up to that, before we formalize this process, we understand that you, on some level, can't be screwing around here with this, right? And we don't formally understand what it means yet, but we know what responsible is and what not responsible looks like, kind of. And we're going to hold you to a duty for being responsible there. One of the things that is really, really nice about working at Mozilla is that we have this thing called the Mozilla, we have the Mozilla Manifesto, right? We have the mission, which means that at any point, I should, in theory, be able to draw a straight line from the thing on my desk to the advancement of the mission in some way, right? I have a philosophical grounding for the work that I'm doing. And I don't think that right now in the cybersecurity field as a whole, I think that we've got a lot of very crude ideas at various levels about what engineering practices look like, about what duty of care or fit for purpose looks like at various levels. But we haven't yet got an aligned way to draw a line, or, or a philosophical way to draw a line from this is a unit of data about a person, whatever that unit looks like, all the way through the intermediate steps that you describe, the security of the protocols and how we test those things, the uh, practices that we build on top of those security protocols and how we reinforce them both at a social and cultural and corporate level, all the way to this idea at the far end of that, which we will eventually need to formalize about the idea of basic human rights, right? We have very much that. If you're talking about um, like automotive safety, 
right? You have at the one end of that, you have criminal negligence, you have duty of care to, you have the duty of care, we have liability if you fail to meet your duty of care as a car manufacturer. Underneath that, we've got standards for engines, standards for tires. I actually went and looked this up and there are 1,200 pages of documentation about what a tire has to be, right? The standards that we expect, and that's just the tire, right? That's not the rims or the axles, that's just the rubber, right? And from there, all the way right down to this is the impact that a human body has to be able to walk away from in this car. And if you don't have that measure of safety down here in a car accident, then you have in some way violated that person's human rights. And the upshot of that in the automotive economy is that Toyota will periodically say, we've run some tests on these cars, we've identified this potential defect in these cars, and we're gonna do a recall on that. And the last time I looked at that, Toyota would recall, Toyota recalls cars millions at a time because of potential defects in a vehicle that have caused no accidents and no fatalities because that is their duty of care to that, right? The thing we don't have right now in cybersecurity and InfoSec in general is this idea of liability, the idea of responsibility, and an aligned set of what liability looks like and what your duty of care looks like with regards to taking care of this stuff, right? Facebook can give away all the information in the world and it's like, oops, what happened? I don't know, I accidentally wrecked democracy. Um, because why? Is anyone gonna hold us liable for that? Nope, because we have no notion in that context of data security, continuity of care. Um, if anything, like, and it's clear that the, in, it's clear that that's partly because the industry is in its infancy. Right, we've had computers for 50 years and we've had civil engineering for 4,000. Right, that's a real difference. Um, but the other part of it is that we as a culture have long worked very, very hard to avoid any kind of responsibility or liability for failures. Right? Um, the idea that you would build software like you, you build cars like you built software, right, is a joke that is as old as software, right, because because the process is brittle as hell. Um, but every time that we write a piece of software and we say no warranty is expressed or implied by this, right? And we say we provide no guarantees that it's fit for purpose and if it breaks, feel free to keep all four pieces, right? Uh, we're avoiding that. Um, I think this is particularly pernicious with respect to free software uh, in general um, because I honestly don't think that free software, I don't think that free as in beer and free as in freedom, right, as in no cost, I don't think that those two things will be able to coexist for a long time in the absence of liability, which is to say in the absence of responsibility for these things. And I get that software is not like anything else, right? Software, you can make it once, you can reproduce it infinite times, and that's special. Um, but if you like, I can actually come back next week and I can give you the other three hours of this answer um, because I do feel strongly about this. Um, but right now, software is in a state that cannot possibly last and that software is a state of profound denial of our responsibilities. Um, right? We can take an idea out of our head and turn that into a machine that changes the world, but we don't get to walk away from that. Right? We don't get to wash our hands of that. Whether it's for InfoSec, whether it's for personal privacy reasons, the only reason we get to get away with that right now is because nobody in our current government, in our current society, has sat down and said, there ought to be a law, right? Which is, so, sorry. And uh, yeah, and so right now everyone's busy genuflecting to the god of innovation. Um, like, oh no, you might have a law, you might prevent somebody from innovating. Well, look, like I don't give you the opportunity to innovate about hockey helmets, right? I can't let you build a $5 hockey helmet that won't take a hit because it's innovative, but I can make a thousand of them, right? There's a reason that that's illegal, and the reason that that's illegal is because it's bad for everybody. And the sooner we get there with software, the better off we're all gonna be. Sorry. We're, no, ha <laughs> no, I'm sorry, we are. Automotive innovations came because the laws were put in. Yes, but those, in, yes, that is true, but those laws were fought tooth and nail until they got there. Yes. 
mean, cars are well-oiled miracle boxes now, largely because of the constraints put on them, not because they were fault. Like, if you ever get a chance to see it, there's a magnificent video of a frontal offset collision between a 1957 Chevy Bel Air, one of those great big monstrous convertibles they had with wings and everything, and a 2007 Malibu. Right? And if you ever want to look at the benefits of regulation, if you ever want to look at the benefits of how regulation stifles an industry, you should watch this video. Right? And if you've ever thought to yourself that old cars are like solid or something because they had steel bumpers, like this frontal offset collision, your straightforward driver's side head on, right? if you look at what happens to those crash test dummies, what you find out is that the Malibu, 2007 Malibu driver, is considered having a fortunate outcome if they avoid a twisted ankle in the process. The person driving the 1957 Bel Air is going to be lucky if every part of him makes it into the same casket. Right? But the car survives that. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. The crash zone and so on in modern cars looks terrible. The car, it does look terrible, but the part of that that is also true is that in the older cars, the crumple zone is your rib cage. It's you. Yeah. You're, you're the crumple zone, yes. Yes, it's super exciting to watch this video. The whole back of the car piles into the guy as it's piling into the car in front of him. Um, software needs to get there. We just have to, right? We can't keep doing this. The cost is too high, um, and it's not sustainable at all. So thank you for your time. It's been a privilege to speak to you all.